Welcome to New Thinking for a New World, a Tilburg Foundation podcast. I am Alan Stoga, your host. Each week, I bring you conversations with people who think differently about the great issues that are shaping our world. Geopolitics, disruptive tech, mass migration, the changing climate, culture wars, all of it is grist for our mill. I hope you enjoy listening. I also hope you will let me know what you think and that you join the conversation at telbergfoundation.org. And now for today's episode of New Thinking for a New World. 2024 is the year of the voter. Worldwide, some 50 countries accounting for almost half of all the people on earth will go to the polls. Many things will be at stake, but the overarching issue will be whether and how democracy can meet the challenges of today's world. In some ways, Chile is the canary in the mine. After President Pinochet was ousted, the country had come to be considered the most stable democracy in South America. But that changed with widespread anti-government rioting in 2019. When the dust cleared, Chileans decided they wanted to rewrite the rules of democracy and launched a highly participative effort to change their constitution. That effort has now failed. Two different versions, one more leftist and one more rightist, were voted down in national referenda. What are the lessons for the rest of us who are trying to figure out how to make our democracies work better? Does the Chilean experience mean that seeking consensus on new constitutions and new institutions is a pipe dream? Can democracies actually fix themselves? My guest today on New Thinking for a New World is Chilean jurist and law dean, Isabel Aninat. Isabel played an important, almost a leading role in the Chilean search for new constitution. She will share some answers or at least some perspectives on what we might learn from Chile. Welcome, Isabel. Thank you, Alan. It's great to be here. Um, So let me do just a brief recap of the last four years uh, in Chile. In October 2019, Chile had a social outburst. After almost a month of violence and massive public demonstrations, almost all the political parties from across the spectrum reach an agreement to start a constitutional process in order to reach a new constitution. Um, This was the institutional response to a wide variety of social issues. We had, of course, to do uh, some modification on the dates because of the pandemic, but in October 2020, we had the entry referendum. Under voluntary voting, 78% of the people voted in favor of having a new constitution and also for it to be drafted by an elected assembly. So this is the first assembly. It functioned for a year starting in July 2021. It was left-leaning, but also mostly characterized by high fragmentation and delegates who lacked previous political experience. Many were independent leaders who came from very specific movements. Their proposal, which included all sorts of issues, was rejected in September 2022 by 64% under mandatory voting. Shortly after, new agreement, again by almost all the political parties. We had a new process in early 2023. Now it was a two-step process. The first step, a group of 24 experts appointed by Congress. They agreed on a first draft. Then came an elected convention, which worked on the draft to issue the final proposal. That convention, the second one, was smaller than the previous one, but now was right-leaning. The Republican Party, as it is called, and this is a new party, which did not believe in constitutional change, but a high representation. They issued the final proposal, which now also included all sorts of issues, and that proposal was again rejected the Sunday before Christmas by 55% of the people under mandatory voting. So we have the first country in the world with two consecutive projections for a new constitution. This is the new Chilean experiment. I wanted to sort of put forward some of questions that we're still pondering about and some issues to reflect. First one, what is the basis for entering a new constitutional process? We, as I mentioned, had very fast procedural agreements on how to conduct the process, how to design it. But there was no real consensus on the substantive issues that we were going to discuss. 
Should we be a presidential system? Should we be a parliamentary system? Should we um, have a more capitalist system in the economy or should we have highly state regulation? Should we move into federalism or should we remain as we are a unitary country? Procedural rules were not enough to generate consensus. And I think this is especially important now because we have times of high social change a lot of influence from social media, and especially low political draft. Thanks for listening so far. I hope you're enjoying the conversation as much as I have. If you haven't already, please subscribe on the platform of your choice and rate us on Apple Podcast. Now back to today's discussion, sponsored by the Stavros Niarchus Foundation, SNF. How do we enter constitutional processes is important in the world that we live on now, and especially because we do not want fragmented negotiations with shifting agendas and volatile majorities. The second issue, what do people really vote for in constitutional referendums? How much is the content, the text, really valued, and how much is the sort of the general understanding of how the process are conducted. This is, I think, unresolved. In the last process, for example, abortion was one of the biggest discussions. Now we saw women voted against the tax more than men. But also we saw that 70% of the population would prefer politicians to reach agreements and to concede. Different polls show that people disagreed, not with the specific issues, but with the general results of how the processes were handled. Another question, and I think this is more for constitutional lawyers, but again, for the general discussion. How important is constitutional law? What is its scope? And this is a question about democracy. What do we understand as the role of Congress? What should be the role of judges? And especially, what is the appropriate legal forum to discuss reforms on social issues, to reach solutions on pensions, on health system, on education, and on climate change? Where is the appropriate forum to discuss and have those issues resolved? And let me tell you one final issue that we're pondering about. And this is about politics in general and not about Chile. Chile is not the only country struggling with politics. The last report on international idea on the global state of democracy shows that more countries have experienced net declines in democracy than improvements. And I think this is a question about fragmentation of the political institutions, decline of the representation of political parties, and especially as we saw on the constitutional experiment, how do we connect with now more volatile and less ideological voters? So one last question. Were the last four years lost? I would say no. I think it's too early to say um, what is the effective political functioning, especially now that we did not do institutional adjustments to the regime. But as we move forward, I think um, we started in an institutional response. And I think we have to go back to the first point, right? We did an institutional channel to a social outburst. This might be seen as straightforward, but I think in the world today, it shows that we did and followed a specific channel. Another thing that I would say we didn't lose the four years, the median voter. Yes, the referendums tended to polarize the political opinion, but also it showed very clearly that voters are moderate, and it was shown twice in Chile. We rejected a left-leaning project, we rejected a right-leaning project. In both processes, we saw voters calling for more widespread agreement and less partisan agendas. And on one last thought, the role of political parties. I would say that demagogue and populists tend to base their agenda on independents being saviors. With no political parties that can process a wide variety of issues and to guide negotiations, it's difficult to put forward successful constitutional processes. Yes, we have to improve political parties, but as we showed again and again in Chile, I hope we learned that lesson that they are vital and fundamental for any democracy. Thank you for listening to this episode of New Thinking for a New World. I'm Alan Stoga, podcast host, and I look forward to your joining our next conversation. Remember, tell us what you think at telbergfoundation.org.